14-302-648, Govan Gowan v. State of Nevada. Good morning, Your Honor. Craig Nobath, Mr. Gowan. As instructed by the court, we have uh, completed, uh, redacted the objective materials and they filed their uh, new brief. All right, I see that here. And um, <clears throat> in this uh, appeal, it seems like there's two mainline issue issues. One, was there a valid consent to uh, allow for a blood draw? And then the second is a chain of custody having to do with the blood sample itself. Yes, sir. So go ahead, Mr. Mueller. Well, Your Honor, um, Respectfully, I don't think there really was much issue here. Um, the officer puts the uh, Mr. Gowan in custody, doesn't, by his own admission, read him the Miranda decision, and then they take him down and draw his blood. They don't read him the implied consent. They don't read him the Miranda decision. There's no implied consent anywhere here. That brings up a couple issues, I think. Yes, sir. Or probably more than a couple. But um, at what, in these kind of cases, it's my view that uh, the better argument establishes some sort of timeline. And that timeline would be, at what point do you think the Miranda warnings are required in the scenario of events? You then compare that to this alleged consent to a blood draw in the timeline and make that argument. The other thing is, um, after the, uh, I think it was the buyer's decision in Nevada, wasn't it, that the right decision, uh, Mr. Nelson? Yes, sir. Stemming from the United States Supreme Court McNeely case, uh, it brings up the question of, do we even have implied consent law required to be read at all? I mean, in other words, can a police officer, after buyers, uh, simply say to somebody who's pulled over on a suspected DUI, assuming there's probable cause, can a police, can a police officer simply say, uh, would you consent or can I take your blood or uh, breath test? And if somebody says, sure, you can go ahead and do that, is that permissible? In other words, do you, is there a legal requirement to even read the implied consent law or even mention it anymore in these sort of scenarios is, is I think, a question. So those are the two areas maybe you can give me your opinion on, Mr. Mueller. Well, Your Honor, the issue on a consent search is always, and not just in DUI context, but in criminal cases in general, is how valid is the consent? Now, I've got a seven-year-old boy, and I can you that if I use the right words, I can get him to consent to almost anything, but that's not a valid consent. I hope so. He's a seven-year-old. He's a seven-year-old. Maybe next year it'll, it'll change. So consent is <coughs> a question of, uh, a mixed question. Well, it'll take till he's about 13. <laughs> it's a, consent legally is a mixed question of fact and law, and all analysis on the subject has to go that way. Okay. Now, we have a legacy <coughs> now law that is, and we, we're stuck with this rather unfortunate term of implied consent, because the origin of that term meant that by having a license in Nevada at the DMV, you have impliedly consented to a blood draw if reasonably requested. And as when I was a young prosecutor, the law at that point was, if you said, no officer, I don't consent, then you violated the implied consent, and you lost your license for right. That's right. It all changed. That's all changed. But right. we've got we've got the label for that procedure still floating out here in the ethos, and it doesn't really apply anymore. Now, what the legislature has done, and they passed AB 67, which is a wholesale revision again of this area of law, as if it wasn't enough uh, to, to make it confusing enough. Now, if the uh, as the law as I understand it now, and, and I would tell the court. Uh, that it should operate is this. If the, the consent is truly voluntary, i.e. an equal, the, the, you're not in custody and the officer is not ex exercising dominion and control over you. Mm -hmm. Someone puts you in handcuffs and is controlling your movements, he now has a psychological advantage over you. That's the whole purpose behind the, uh, the Miranda decision and a lot of the reasoning behind this. That when an officer is towering over you with his gun and his badge and his radio on his shoulder going off out uh, with all sorts of official calls, and he says, do you consent? Your eyes don't get big and say, meekly say, well, yes, I do. That's not consent, that's duress, all right? What consent, true consent is arm's length negotiations. Hey, Mr. Nelson, how are you, sir? Good day today. I was wondering if I could look in your uh, attache case or satchel. And Mr. Nelson says, sure, officer, no problem. He's not in custody. He agrees to it, that's truly consent. That's not this case. In this case, he's in custody. 
He's in custody. He's not allowed to leave. He's not been arrested, and he's not read the Miranda decision. Now, the officer can claim valid consent here, but that's circumstances where valid consent cannot be had. Had he walked up and he says, uh, I've got reports from a couple citizens. It appears that you were driving. There's apparently a little bit of an accident here. Do you mind if I get a blood draw from you to see if you're okay? Or how about you blow in this machine for me? And the guy says, sure, officer, I'm fine. That's consent. You're in handcuffs. You're standing against the wall. You're put in the back of the uh, patrol car. That's not consent, and that is not a doctrine of law that is available here. That's why, that. that's why I mentioned that yes, the better practice, in my view, is to tell me what you think happened here in this case on that timeline. Certainly. Now, I, I've got just a tad disadvantage. I, I did read the transcript, but Mr. Morey was actually trial counsel on this, so I don't have quite the, the command of facts having seen it all myself. But as I read the transcript, there was an accident. Not one, but two gentlemen were out of the car. They're milling about for some extended period of time before the officer arrives. The guys start walking away, or a couple people start walking away. The officer stops him, puts him in handcuffs, and then says, hey, um, doesn't Mirandize him, doesn't even say you're under arrest, and just takes him down for a consensual blood draw. I don't believe this was valid consent, and it should, have, should not have been admitted. So I take it you think that the Miranda warning should have been given when the handcuffs are on and someone's in custody, and I take it that your argument is that the request which led to this blood draw that came up at point one seven, right? Yes, sir happened um, post-custody. It's custodial interrogation. Absolutely. Okay. Now, you, 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 I mean, the reason you read the Miranda decision is so you tell people they have the right to remain silent. If you haven't advised them and you're now asking for consent, well, what is the purpose of the consent? The consent is to obtain incriminatory evidence or suspicious, suspected incriminatory evidence. Okay, I understand that. that that's yes. an analysis having to do with the timeline. It, yes, in my view, as to when things occurred, under what circumstances they occurred. Anytime you have that sort of Miranda issue, that's what you have to do. In my, my opinion, that's something I'd have to do here. Yes, sir. Separate and distinct to that, uh, what do you make of this implied consent law? Is it a requirement for officers to even mention that post uh, buyers, buyers and McNeely? <laughs> I don't believe they need to have mentioned it anymore. It seems like the officers think that too, from the cases I've seen. Yes, sir. Well, if, if, <clears throat> sir, would you like to give us, a, if the guy is truly not in custody and some citizen sincerely consents, hey, can you step over to our van, please? I did, I'll, if you blow, okay, if you step over to our van or can I draw your blood? Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, sure, I'm a middle class guy, I don't do anything wrong, I'll, I'll more than happy to cooperate, officer. That's consent, but that's not this case. It really brings up an interesting issue to me, and that is if we assume for the purposes of this argument that after McNeely and Byers, there's no more implied consent law. It seems like that's the upshot of it. Yes, sir. The question becomes, what about Miranda then? What does this do in light of potentially having somebody in custody and talking about whether they would consent to a breath or blood test? I would believe... I mean, it's an interesting issue to me. Yes, sir. I believe respectfully <clears throat> that the best way to think of this is a rubber band, which now snapped back and DUI chemical test analysis probably become no different than a drug, the drug possession case. If the officer grabs you up, throws you against the wall, and then starts throwing, tearing through your stuff and finds the drugs, that doesn't come in because there's no consent to search and, and there's no probable cause. Now, if you go and ask somebody for a chemical test and it's truly a consensual test, then they've got consent. But if you're in custody, non-Mirandized, you're not free to leave, and the officer says, in a menacing way, would you like to consent to a blood draw? That's not consent. Okay, I understand the argument. I think it's an interesting one. Let me hear what Mr. Nelson thinks about it. Well, it's interesting that uh, we talk about the timeline because the timeline is when the defendant started driving, he consented to a test. Nobody had to ask him. That's a condition of him being able to drive in a public roadway. That is why NRS 484C.160 says that when an officer has reasonable grounds to believe someone is DUI, which, by the way, means in 99.99% .99 of the cases the person is going to be in custody, <coughs> his reasonable grounds are essentially probable cause, the officer can 
have the person take a test. If the person refuses to take a test currently, he will lose his license for a year or three years if he's refused before. In other words, there's an administrative sanction. Mr. Mueller's error is that he is calling this the right to refuse. There is no right to refuse. Why not? Because what is the essence of every constitutional right? You can't be punished for exercising it. If we were to do this trial and the defendant didn't testify, I could not stand up at the end of the case and say, well, Your Honor, the defendant didn't testify, therefore he knows he's guilty. That would be improper because he has the right not to testify. But in the exact same case, I can stand up at the end of the case and say, Your Honor, the defendant refused to take a test in this case, therefore he is guilty. That's an admission of guilt. Why? Because there is no constitutional right to refuse to take a test. Every state in the Union, Nevada being the last one, now imposes either a civil or a criminal penalty. If you refuse to take a test in Minnesota, you go to jail for up to a year if, you're, if your underlying offense was a felony DUI. What the officer did when he arrested the defendant was basically gave the defendant an opportunity to refuse, not the right, the opportunity. Sir, are you willing to take a blood test? The defendant's response is, yes, I am. There is no Miranda right any more than there's a Miranda right when somebody's taken down to the jail and the officer says, sir, I'm going to photograph you, but first let me advise you of your Miranda opinion. You have no right to refuse to be photographed. You have no right to refuse, according to the United States Supreme Court, to, con to basically be subject to a body cavity search as a result of being arrested. And in every state in the union, you have no right to refuse to take a test because there's a penalty if you do. There is no requirement that the officer advise the defendant of anything. AB 67 did change the law slightly. It says that if you refuse, you must be told that you will lose your license. That statute, of course, wasn't in effect when this case occurred. But in, say, someone gets arrested for DUI today, it's still perfectly proper for the officer to say, hey, would you like to take a blood or breath test? If the person says, I'm not taking any tests, then the officer has to say, well, sir, be aware that if you refuse, you're going to lose your license for a minimum of one year. This was express consent. The Supreme Court recognized express consent in State v. Davis. The Supreme Court recognized in State v. Robinson that there is no Miranda right with regard to the implied consent law. Number one, because you have no right to an attorney at this point. It's not a critical stage. And number two, you have no right to remain silent. If you choose not to take a test, you get punished. So, Your Honor, it's the state's position with regard to the implied consent issue. It's perfectly proper for an officer to say, hey, you will, will you take a test? The officer can say that whether you're under arrest or not under arrest. Miranda has already been held not to apply to implied consent requests. So there is no issue here. Unless the court has any questions, that's all I have to say on this particular issue. Well, I'll give Mr. Mueller the last word then. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I'm always impressed with Mr. Nelson's encyclopedic command of cases and knowledge, but I did detect a, a, a leap there that was not supported. Specifically, this is criminal proceedings. Criminal procedure is five, apply. Now, we got the implied consent sort of back in AB 67. How this plays out in the real world is obviously it takes a few years for the cases to work through. Mm -hmm. Having said that, here's what the officer encounters. And this is the facts of this case. I come up, the officer didn't make the arrest. He didn't put the guy in handcuffs. He didn't verify that the man was Mirandized. Then continued to gather evidence from him. <coughs> Would you like the consent? Well, the guy's in handcuffs. Now, that's, that's, that is a situation that even the first year rookie, the first day at the academy, would recognize, I know, I know, he's under arrest. He's not free to leave. When you're not free to leave, regardless of the administrative penalties that the DMV supplies, you have a right to be, remain silent, and you have a right. Now, had he invoked or been Mirandized and been properly informed of his rights as required by law, he might very well have said, you know, officer, respectfully, <clears throat> you need to go get a warrant. You got the wrong guy. And that's a very valuable right. But that wasn't an opportunity given him here because of op the officer in proper procedure. Now, I mean, he showed up. The guy's in handcuffs. That's not really a, a debatable point in this po the transcript. And, and, and right. It's an interesting point, one for me to think about in conjunction with everything that has evolved in this area. And so 
though, as you know, I typically make decisions contemporaneous with the arguments. This one I'm going to take under advisement. Okay, I, Judge, it's, I want to also look at the transcript more intently of the timeline. I think it might be important to me. Sure, so thank that's, you, Judge. That's what I'll do. Good morning, Eric. Greg Miller, Beth.